So for probability part two, this is a pretty big uh, slideshow that I'm going to be voicing over. If you would like to, there's a document that's going to be attached um, on the video tab at the very, very bottom that's going to include all of these slides. I would do it three per page and then write the examples off to the side and any comments that you want to make um, off to the side. And we're going to be looking at those when we check your notes. So do them off to the side and then add notes of your own as we go along. Uh, so for probability part two, we're looking more at compound probability versus the simple probability that we studied before. So compound probability is just when you're doing two or more things. Um, and one of the things to, to keep in mind is that you want to figure out how many different ways the event could play out. Um, that's called a sample space. So for a sample space, it's going to be all of the possible outcomes as a collection. For instance, if you have a bag that has a red, a blue, and a green tile, and then another bag that has a red, and a blue tile, um, it wants to know what are the possible outcomes and then how many outcomes are in the sample space. So to answer the first question, you're going to need some sort of systematic way of doing this. And the second one will show you a, a shortcut later on. So to answer what are the possible outcomes, you should think, oh, I could do a table. Or if you were I to can use a, a table, counting tree. Um, you would do something like this. So for the first bag, it has you know two of each color. And the second bag, it only has one of each color. So all the possible outcomes are listed in this table here. And you would read it as, you know, outcome number one would be a red and then a red. Outcome number two is a red and then a blue. So if you con continue with that logic, it looks like there are uh, six possible outcomes. All right, so there are six possible outcomes, and what are they? You can list them like this. So it's kind of like you're using the code that you established here to save yourself some work. Okay? The second way that you could do with a counting tree. So with the tree diagram, if I have two events, you're going to have essentially two different levels of your tree. So what are the events of the first one? So the first bag contained a red, a blue, and a green. And then the little branches coming down is going to be for your second event. So for the second event, we only had a red and a blue. So say you chose the red the first time. The second way it could play out red or it could play out blue. The same thing if you drew a blue the first from the first bag. You either got a red or you got a blue, and you just continue like this. And we know that we're done on this tree because we only had two different events. This was bag one on the first line, bag two on the second line, and then when you you list your outcomes, you're essentially just going down the tree like this. So you got a red, a red is one of them, a red, a blue, and then the next one you say blue and then red, and then you notice that you have the exact same outcomes that we had with the table. So you have the same six outcomes listed here. Okay? So a tree diagram or a table. If you are um, using a t tree diagram, try this example on your own. So you've got four cards and two tiles in a board game. The cards are, uh, looks like north, south, east, or west, and the tiles are just numbered one and two. So if you select a card and a tile, what are all the possible outcomes, and then how many outcomes are in the sample space? So again, if you try the t t tree diagram, the first event is your cards. So you've got these outcomes for your cards. I did it kind of out of order. And the second event are your numbers, and it's either a one or a two. So this is how your tree diagram would look for that particular series of events. So if it asks what is the outcome, you would say, you know, it's either n then a one, n then a two, s then a one, s then a two, w one, w two, uh, E1 and then E2. So here are your outcomes and then you can see how many there are. Looks like 2, 4, 6, and 8. So 8 possible outcomes. Right? And then again, here it is uh, as a review. Okay? So you look at this and you think there's a faster way to answer the question how many outcomes are there? So there's something called the fundamental counting principle that says that you can multiply um, the total number of outcomes uh, together to calculate the sample space. And here's what I mean. Um, for example, if she rolls two number cubes, how many outcomes are possible? Well, it's sort of like this. I have two events, so two events, 
and then what are the outcomes for, or how many outcomes in each event. If you roll a cube, there's six ways it could happen. So there's six ways in the first event, and there are six ways in the second event. And the fundamental counting principle says that I can multiply those two outcomes together to find the total outcomes in the sample space. So for rolling a cube twice, I come up with 36 possible different outcomes. Right. <clears throat> so you can list them or you can go straight to the counting principle. Right. So example four, try these two on your own before we discuss them. So A says how many outcomes are in the sample space for flipping four fair coins? And then B, how many outcomes are there for choosing a meal from these uh, three different types of uh, decisions, right? So for the first one, this is how I like to do the counting principle. You think how many events are, are happening, and I like to put them in kind of a little open top box. So if I'm flipping four coins, I'm going to say, here are my four events, and I know with the counting principle I'm going to be multiplying those outcomes together. And then inside of there is how many outcomes are possible per, per event. So if you're flipping a coin, that's two possible ways it could happen, heads or tails, and every single time it's going to be two possible outcomes. So when you multiply them together, essentially that's four times four, there are 16 outcomes for this first one. Right? That same logic, you think, how many decisions do I have to make on B? And you're like, okay, I've got an entree, I've got a drink, and then I have desserts. So you think, what goes inside the box? Well, how many ways the entrees could turn out? So there are four different entrees, there are three drinks, and two desserts. So when you multiply all those together, you'll find that the sample space is 12 times 2, 24 different combinations that could have been made. Okay? Um, when we talk about compound events, we're dealing now with two or more uh, events. Okay? So within the compound uh, events, it could either be independent or independent. So this slide kind of tells you the vocabulary that you need to start using. Um, for the first simple one as a review, if I ask something like, what is the probability of rolling a 4 on a standard number cube, this is an example of a simple probability. It's just one of six. Um, if I ask what is the probability of the complement of that event, complement just means what is the probability of that not happening. So it's every every other possibility besides the one that's um, emphasized. So if the probability is one out of six, the probability of its complement or not rolling a four would be five out of six. And notice that the prob probability of compound events, if I add them up, it's going to be equal to one. Okay. So compound probability, again, can be divided into either independent probability or dependent probability. And that only applies when I have two or more events, known as compound probability. Okay? So if you read this example, you see that um, what one kid chooses won't influence what the other kid chooses. Um, so that's going to be an example of independent probability. So for instance, if you draw... Um, multiple times, so if I'm drawing two or more, but every single time you're putting back what you drew previously, this is going to be independent probability. Okay. If, however, the first kid chooses a topic and then the second kid is limited by that topic because the teacher doesn't want the uh, any repeats of reports, that's going to be known as dependent probability. So what happens on the first time does indeed affect what happens on the second time. That's referred to as dependent. So examples of this means you're drawing and then you're not replacing things. So you're taking marbles out of a bag, keeping what you drew the first time, so that when you reach in the second time, you actually have less to choose from. That's dependent probability. Okay. The other thing that um, a lot of y'all tend to struggle with is if you're drawing at the exact same time, which we'll refer to as simultaneous draws, this is also dependent probability. Okay. So for this one, do now number one, you're going to have several of them. So this is with A. Just say whether or not it's independent or dependent, and then explain your answer. So if she's drawing from a, a set of four cards and then rolling a number cube, Hopefully you said that that thing was independent because the results do not influence uh, the other, right? The results of the draw does not influence the results of the roll, okay? Um, same thing. If one kid chooses a book and then uh, another kid chooses a book from what remains, well, that's kind of... Uh, 
telling you that the sample space, the choices that the second kid have has been limited, so that's going to be a dependent probability. Okay? Um, this one, if you flip a coin and you get heads, and then you roll a six on a number cube, it should also be independent because the coin has no effect on the number cube. Okay? Uh, for this one, she chooses a blue from a set of three. And then the second kid chooses a second marble from the remaining. So again, this is a key that the sample space has been lowered and it's dependent probability. All right? So they can't pick the same color because there's um, one color essentially missing after Annabelle draws the first time. All right? This one um, is a little bit trickier because you have three nickels and five quarters in a pocket. If you reach into the pocket and grab two coins, that's implying that it's being drawn at the same exact time. So again, this is going to be dependent because it's a simultaneous draw. You're not going to reach in there and go after the exact same coin. So what you have, um, you have two different coins. It's impossible to grab onto the same one with two draws. So anytime you're dra drawing at the same time, just think of that as being dependent, right? Um, now, when you have compound probability and it, they do not influence each other, that's independent probability, we're going to multiply the two individual probabilities together to get that compound probability. So mathematically, you're going to see it kind of like this. If you have an event A and you have an event B, um, you're going to multiply their individual probabilities like so. Right? So you would say probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. And you'll see this in action in just a second. So for example five, um, what is the probability of choosing a green marble uh, from a bag containing five green and ten white, and then flipping a coin and getting uh, tails? So you can write this as, what is the probability of getting green and tails? So now we're implying that it's two probabilities, it's compound. So you can break this down into the probability of green times the probability of getting tails. And these are independent of each other, right? So you don't have to worry about the sample space changing. So the probability of gre getting green would be, um, so how many are green? So five are green, and then 10 are white. So that's actually 15 total marbles. And then the probability of getting tails we know is just to be 1 over 2. And remember when you're multiplying fractions, you can simplify each fraction normally or you can do some cross simplifying. So before I just multiply the numerators, I look at this first probability and I say, well, 5, 15 is really 1 over 3. And once everything is relatively prime, I can find that final probability, we refer to this as the compound probability, of 1 out of 6. Okay, so the probability that both of this, these events happen is 1 out of 6. Right. Uh, and there it is again. Uh, for the second one, so do now number 2. If you haven't printed these notes, you want to jot down the specifics of this problem so that you can re reference it later. And it's what is the probability of choosing a red from a bag with 5 red and 5 white, and then flipping a coin and getting heads. So again, it is compound probability, and this event is also independent because drawing from a bag uh, has no effect of flipping a coin. So now you can set it up like this and I have compound probability, therefore I multiply the two together. And you think, what is the probability of getting red? Well, there are five red out of how many total marbles? It looks like 10. And then the probability of getting ahead is one out of two, so times one half. If you look at this simplified, it's really one half here, simplifying normally. So that compound probability is one out of four. So the more events that you, um, you include, if I were to do maybe five events, if you're multiplying the probability, which is a fraction, the compound probability at the, at the end is just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the likelihood that, you, that five events will go your way is smaller than the likelihood that two events are going to go your way. Okay? So if you have um, dependent events now, you also multiply their individual probabilities but the sample space is going to change every single time. And what's going to happen is every time you multiply your fractions, that denominator is going to get one less because you figured there's going to be one less to choose from. And the main example for dependent probability that we'll de deal with is if you're drawing and then you're not putting back what you drew. It's called drawing without replacement. 
Okay? So again, this looks very, very similar, but the way you pronounce it is the probability of A times the probability that B will happen after all A's already happened. Right? That's going to be right? So for example, on this one, you have five historical books and three sci-fives. What is the probability that he'll get a historical for his first report? Keep it, so here's the key that this is dependent probability, then choose a science fiction book for his second. So we can say something like this. What is the probability of historical, then sci-fi, given that he's already drawn the historical and he's kept it. So we could say something like without replacement. So if you're showing your work you can do something like this to indicate that it is dependent probability. And it works the same. So we think what's the probability of getting historical? Well it's five out of eight books and here's the difference. When he goes the second time he no longer has eight books because he kept that one so notice that I have now seven books to choose from so that sample space the number of outcomes has been decreased by only one how many are sci-fi well three so I have a compound probability here I see if I can simplify normally I simplify across and I can't so we have 15 over 8 times 7 56. So the compound probability of this particular series of events happening is 15 out of 56. Okay. So here's the explanation again. Um, 15 over 56. So with this one, try to do this one on your own also, and then pause it, and then we can discuss. So y'all should have seen that she isn't putting this card back so each so for the second time she draws she has one less card so it's the the product of four sevenths times three sixths um, which you could have simplified these two normally and then four and two four over two is really two over one which leads us to the simplified probability of two sevenths uh, fast okay Okay, so for the final do now, you're determining whether it's independent or dependent, and then doing the probability for B. So in the first one, hopefully you chose that it is dependent because it says the remaining pieces implies that it is less, um, less to choose from with each consecutive turn. On the second one, this is a little bit tricky because it says what is the probability that both are bill caps? Because she is drawing at the same time, this is a dependent probability. So the first time around, she has eight ch caps to choose from, five of which are beanies. Then you're going to multiply that by the probability that she'll get his, a bill the second time, given that she already drew one. So normally with dependent, we for sure see the denominator is being decreased by one. But in this ca case, because it's the same type, you have one less bill cap also. So when you find the compound probability, you can cross simplify here, and your final compound probability is 5 over 14.